Okay, so thanks, Sarah. Um, again, yeah, my name is Erin Stewart, uh, and my title today is Field-Based Critical Thermal Maximum Demonstrates Intraspecific Variation in Thermal Tolerance of a Stream Salmonid, which you can see here was a brook trout. Quickly, before I get started, I wanted to thank my two supervisors, Graham Raby and Chris Wilson, for their funding and their guidance, um, as well as the numerous other partners and volunteers that I had last summer that helped me out with all my field work. I could not have done it without everyone's help. So the overarching theme of my research is investigating intraspecific variation in thermal tolerance in fishes. Mackenzie et al. 2021 suggests that the three elements of this are ontological and physiological changes that occur through body sizes and life stages, phenotypic plasticity both within and among individuals, and genetically based heritable variation that exists among individuals or populations. Throughout my graduate research, I'm gonna be investigating each of these elements to identify what mechanisms within these drive thermal tolerance and how much variation exists within a species. Having a diverse response to thermal stress is gonna be key for population persistence under an increasingly warm and variable environment. This diversity could be exhibited either within populations or through local adaptation among populations. There's strong evidence of this local adaptation of thermal tolerance in salmonids across individuals, families, and populations. But at what level is this variation the most important for conservation? My research uses brook trout as a study species. Variation in brook trout thermal tolerance has been observed both among populations and across large geographical areas. Their realized thermal niche, or what we see them occupying in the wild, is 10 to 20 degrees Celsius, which is one of the widest of the salmonids. Stream resident populations across Ontario are genetically distinct, and it's likely that they're all locally adapted. These populations experience a wide range of thermal conditions with some groundwater fed streams never reaching above 10 degrees Celsius while other lake fed streams could be well above 20 degrees Celsius in the summer. Streams across their range are becoming increasingly warm and variable as a result of climate change and land use change, which puts these populations at a higher risk than our migratory or our lake resident populations given the lack of thermal refuge in streams. Smith and Ridgway's review of brook trout thermal biology literature has identified some key gaps in our understanding of brook trout thermal tolerance, even though they're one of the first and most widely studied species in this topic. Most of our research about brook trout thermal tolerance has come from lab-based studies, which produce significant, significantly different results than field-based studies. Studies that have been done often don't use standardized methods, and therefore it's hard to compare them against each other and use this information for conservation and management. Smith and Ridgway point to the importance of quantifying and reporting on thermal acclimation in thermal tolerance studies, which would improve these comparisons. By improving our understanding of acclimation and addressing these gaps, we can provide important context and context for conducting field-based studies, which improves our understanding of thermal tolerance overall. Both of the studies that I'm presenting to you today have used critical thermal maximum, or what I will refer to as CT max, as the measurement of upper thermal tolerance. CT max is defined as the temperature at which a fish loses equilibrium, so when it turns over and is no longer able to right itself. Short-term exposures of a few minutes at this temperature would induce significant physiological harm or death. I experimentally determine this by increasing the water temperature at a steady rate until I observe loss of equilibrium, and then I immediately remove the fish from thermal stress. CT max has been foundational for studying upper thermal tolerance for decades. It provides context for population and species specific thermal plasticity and resiliency to climate change. I used it in both my lab based study and a field based study. In my lab based study, I asked what is the measurable effect that acclimation has on upper thermal tolerance in terms of both temperature and duration of acclimation. My predictions were that CT max would increase with increasing acclimation, it would increase with increasing duration of acclimation, but would eventually plateau, and that there wouldn't be differences among families of the same strain. For this study, I used nine single cross families of two-year-old wild origin fish reared from eggs at the Codrington Fisheries Research Facility. I had three temperature treatments, ambient plus three and plus six, and each of these followed the natural diurnal cycle of the inflow at the hatchery. At days 1, 4, 8, 16, and 30, I randomly selected six fish from each replicate and I tested CT max, starting from the temperature that they were acclimated to that morning. This is the CT max setup that I used in both my field and lab based study. Uh, so the top cooler there, you're seeing the hot tub, which was the heaters, the aerators, and the pumps. Um, and then that created circular flow between my two tanks. At the bottom, you'll see my CT max arena where I divided it by replicate. Um, and the temperature logger was housed in there as well. I increased the water temperature at four degrees Celsius in both, uh, four degrees Celsius an hour in both of my experiments. 
So this is the result of my lab-based study. So you can see that CT max is shown against duration of acclimation on the X and the treatments are in different colors. So what I saw here was that treatments were different from each other as early as day one, but duration of acclimation played a role following day eight, where days eight, 16, and 30 were all significantly different from days one and four and from each other. 72% of the variation that I observed in CT max was due to acclimation and 3% of the variation was due to family effects. So what this told me is that CT max was dependent on acclimation temperature, duration of acclimation and family. In my field-based study, I asked, are there discernible interpopulation differences in upper thermal tolerance of wild stream resident brook trout? I predicted that CT max would increase with increasing acclimation temperature. It would vary across body sizes and that I would see among population differences. I studied 19 sites across Ontario, three northeast of Thunder Bay, one in Algonquin Park, and 15 in southern Ontario uh, that stretch from the east side of Hamilton all the way across um, to Peterborough. Uh, for my analysis today, I can only focus in on my lower 16. Uh, in, at each field site, I had a temperature logger deployed a minimum of 14 days prior to sampling. Unfortunately, now I wish I had 30 days of data, but what can you do? Um, after that, I electrofished each site, either with my own team or with help from the conservation authorities, um, and it was always graceful. Uh, across my 19 sites, I studied 394 wild brook trout. They ranged in size from 74 millimeters to 289 millimeters, and that was because early in the season I needed to exclude the young of year. I observed CT max from 27.4 to 30.4 degrees Celsius with a mean of 29, uh, and that lined up really well with what I've seen in the literature. Here you're seeing the inside and the above view of my CT max tanks as the fish became agitated. Following CT max, I recovered each fish and then I took its fork length weight and a scale sample. Uh, and then I released each fish into the stream and overall I only had a 0.025% mortality rate. Here you're seeing all 19 sites um, organized by increasing acclimation temperature along the X. Each site is its own box and each fish is its own point. So you can see that I had a huge range of acclimation temperatures here. My cold site, uh, coldest site was the shallow sandy groundwater fed stream in the Kanaraska forest and the acclimation here was 8.29. My warmest three sites were just northeast of Thunder Bay and they were all lake fed streams that were a lot more bedrock and boulder substrate. Um, I did see a clear incre uh, increase in the field CT max temperatures as well um, with the average daily mean being over 10 degrees higher than my coldest site. So that means that I observe brook trout across their entire realized thermal niche and beyond. Um, so the results I'm showing to you now won't include these three sites, unfortunately. So this is showing you the 16 I could analyze, and it's showing you a properly scaled x-axis in this one. So it's showing you the clear trend that I observed during my field work. And that was that for every 10 degrees increase in 14 day average daily mean, I had a 1.8 degrees Celsius increase in CT max. Uh, so far, what I've modeled are fork length, 14 day average, 14 day uh, average mean, sorry, 14 day average max, 14 day average mean, 14 day average fluctuation and populations. My best fit model so far includes the 14 day mean and population as factors. So 52% of my CT max variation was accounted for by acclimation, 28% uh, were among population differences, and the other 20% would be differences among individuals. Now I need to include things like watershed characteristics and probably year long temperature regimes for each site to dive into that further and I need to add in my Thunder Bay sites as well. So to summarize and to bring it all back to those three elements of intraspecific variation, I observed both differences due to phenotypic plasticity and through genetically based heritable variation among families and populations. What I didn't see that I did expect to see was that change across body sizes and life stages. So what I want to leave you with today is that in my two studies, I found that thermal acclimation accounted for three quarters of the variation I observed in the lab. And even with only two weeks of acclimation data, it accounted for over half of the variation I observed in the field. Between my two studies, I observed intraspecific variation among individuals, families, and populations. So overall, although upper thermal tolerance was heavily influenced by acclimation, there were clear differences arising from other factors that I plan to investigate in more depth. These studies both provide important information for quantifying and reporting acclimation in future studies, and they demonstrate the feasibility of doing a field-based evaluation of thermal tolerance. Thank you.